You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. Every time we go to a hackathon, beyond eating pizza and <laughs> having fun. So we do a lot of work within that event to really understand how people are using our APIs. If they are struggling to move forward with something specifically, if they're providing some kind of feedback, we, we call it everything and we bring that information back to the company. And that is super, super interesting and it's working really well. Okay, we should do that because it brings value. It helps to share the knowledge in the company because everybody is learning from the same guidelines. It helps to standardize the processes so we can create templates, we can standardize tooling because everybody is building the same way. So I, I really believe that way of having roster in a team and creating the support as a learning channel, but not as something that you're a punishment, it's really great. Yeah, sometimes we receive question about one specific data and like, oh my God, do we have that in the hour API? Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Your hosts today are myself, Annette Pozsár, and my colleague, Laura Vas. In our daytime jobs, we research and build developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hey, Annette. And uh, welcome. Our guests today are Alvaro Navarro and Anthony Rue. They both admitted to be uh, DevRels, more specifically. They are leading the developer relations and API product management team on the Amadeus for Developers open API product for the travel industry. It's really great that uh, you're here and welcome. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ned. Thank you for having us. Hi, everybody, and thanks for inviting us. Good pleasure to be here. Some of our listeners, uh, they may have uh, met you at uh, the API the Docs conference when it was still live in Amsterdam in 2019. Um, you and uh, several of your colleagues were showcasing that they the API management and documentation processes at Amadeus from three perspectives, API governance, product management, support and user feedback. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but there's kind of a funny story attached <laughs> to this. So we were when we were selecting the talks, the talks uh, that from what was submitted, uh, we were keeping it so extremely fair. We did like a double blind selection uh, and we didn't know who submitted the talk, what company, none of that. So, and then when we put together the program, then we pulled back the blindfold and we have to like double check, like, oh my God, we selected three talks from Omodos. <laughs> How did we do this? <laughs> and then we decided to just embrace this um, as, a, as a, a deep dive. And um, so we had like three amazing presentations on the same API program from three very different angles. And that was, that was great, like variations on a theme and a showcase at that. That was 2019, November or October. So I'm, I'm very interested what happened since then, but let's walk around and through the program first. Can you tell us the beginnings of the program? How and when did you get yourselves involved in this? Okay, I can start by presenting a bit the, the program. Um, so Amadeus for Developers is a new innovation program born in Amadeus. So the uh, mission of this program is to uh, improve the way developers are connecting to uh, our company. And how do they do that? Well, we have a developer portal and we have a set of APIs ready to be consumed by developers, okay? So the idea was to present on one side the um, framework, the APIs that developers have been using for many, many years, people coming from our customers, but also to provide a new framework, a new set of APIs, what is called the self-service API, where developers can connect in a matter of three minutes and start building applications with, uh, with these APIs. The, the program was born in 2017, 2016, Anthony, yeah, am I right? Uh, we had a lot of discussions internally to know <laughs> if we should bring a program like that or not. Uh, the fact is we're providing APIs for many years, for more than 30 years, but mainly to travel big players. So people are really in the industry for a long time. And what we noticed in the last years is we had more and more requests for people who needed travel uh, services or data, but that were not really familiar with how travel works. And the services were designed for people who have known very well the travel industry. So that way took a bit of time to know how to tackle that, how to really offer the self service part where anyone who doesn't even know how travel industry works to be able to onboard, learn, and be able to create the solutions they wanted. Uh, internally, we started maybe in 2015, something like that, uh, but we started really having the product, API, and starting to have some users in 2017. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So part of, uh, of our job is to, um, as you introduced Laura before, is um, to manage the developer relation team. So we do a lot of work um, in terms of um, improving the way that uh, developers are perceiving and consuming our API. So we work a lot on, a lot on um, developer experience, documentation, code samples, prototypes, etc. But also we manage the self-service API catalog. So we make, we make sure that the um, people have the right APIs for building uh, applications. Could you give some numbers? So uh, on the DevRel team, how many people are you? And then internally, how many developers are serving? And when you say API catalog, so when I go to developer.amazaus.com, I see open access APIs and I see enterprise APIs. So just to get a good idea of the scope of what you're dealing with. And maybe I can start by explaining as well. So the team, the team we have is not only DevRel uh, and API. So we build the Amadeus or developers team, which is really handling all the program and the product itself. Uh, we handle that as a startup team. So the idea is we are part of a big corporation and we usually work with big clients. So that works very well. But if you want to start working with independent developers, startups, or, or smaller companies that they grow usually much faster and they need to have a certain uh, agility or flexibility on processes. So we set up the team having very uh, different profiles. And that's some of the people you met at the conference in 2019. Uh, we had actually people who are not at all part of the developer relations team, but did amazing presentations. Uh, so we have strategy people, uh, communication, marketing, event management, product management, and so on. So we're already organized like a small startup. And then you're right, we're offering two, what we call two different catalogs. We have the enterprise catalog, which is the offering we have for many years for the big travel players. And this one has very various technologies, uh, more than 1,000, I would say more than 1,000 different APIs uh, using some old or more recent technologies. Uh, but this one is not open to everybody. There's a process when you get, uh, you contact the company, usually you're put in contact with an account manager and you have specific needs. And that account manager will help you to onboard and get access to the services you need. On the self-service part, we've decided to have a totally different approach when we selected very specific services uh, based on the feedback of the startup we're working with, the ones that were the most relevant. We changed the way they were built and designed so anybody could access them. Uh, and we open them in an open way. So today we have a bit more, I would say 30 APIs, maybe around 50 different endpoints. Mm -hmm. And it's very transversal. We cover different parts of the traveler journey. And about the team, so the DevRel API and customer support, we have one team. So we have very three different streams, uh, everything from support, community management, and so on. The part of API product management, so building the, the vision, uh, the API, the design, and developer relation, which is more on the code samples, SDKs, blog articles. Uh, and we are now, less, uh, now less, a bit less than 10. So basically, you have cross-function uh, teams. Um, yeah. How does it work in your day-by-day -day work? I think it's working fine, right? And I mean, uh, the, the point is in the developer relations team, we have a very transversal position. So we have to interact with a lot of people from marketing, comms, uh, strategy, and so on. Um, yeah, so far, so good, I think. Uh, and it's a very good way to learn new uh, skills from people that, for example, marketing for me was something completely new. And, you know, and working with uh, people from marketing uh, gives you the possibility to learn new uh, new stuff. and. Uh, we can complain in that way. <laughs> I personally love it. Uh, I think it brings different opinions, different backgrounds, different profiles. And whatever we build, we are well, still quite a small team and I would say very agile. So you're really able to cross your, your ideas, to have reviews, peer reviews, and feedback all the time. And that's very valuable for us. And it helps us to be very fast because whatever we need, or almost whatever we need, we have someone that has the skill to help us to deliver it or to bring it. So we can try a lot of things uh, very fast. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned that uh, this program is not only open, but uh, fully self-service. How fully self-service is it and what elements are necessary to achieve it? So yeah, the, the main idea was we're going to open the services to any literally all developers in the world without restrictions. And if we want that to be able to scale up and to work, we need to automate all the processes. And our goal was really to make the onboarding process as smooth and as simple as possible. And for that, for us, it means removing all the barriers. So it means you can come and discover what we offer, 
without the need to create an account. So you can access literally all documentations we have without the need to create an account to see if it's actually what you're looking for. Our pricing model is public, uh, the API documentations, SDK, code sample, the functional documentation, you can access absolutely everything. Uh, the only part when you need to create an account is if you want to start playing with the API. In that case, we have created a sandbox. So in literally three minutes, so after five questions, you can get access to the sandbox when you can try all our APIs in a very similar environment than production. And of course, at no cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're satisfied, you're able to build prototype, even maybe pitch to your potential customers or investors, you can then decide to move to production. And that part is as well fully automated. We do not review uh, the applications of our, uh, of our customers. We don't check what they are doing in a sense that you don't need to contact us and we need to manually validate your process to production. Everything is fully automated. You go to the portal, you enter your payment information, a few personal information, and in a couple of minutes, you have access to the full and limited um, services in production. And that was very key for us to make the onboarding process very smooth and easy to offer it to the maximum number of people. Mm -hmm. To be fair, we have a couple of APIs, uh, one API, which is not yeah. fully self-service, uh, which is the one for booking flights, but because of course you are uh, you're going to modify the inventory of an airline and that mm -hmm. requires a bit of manual validation. But the rest of the of the catalog, 99% of the catalog is fully self-service. So as Anthony mentioned, so you go to the portal, you register, play with APIs, move to production, sign the, uh, the contract uh, with the sign, and you are good to go. And the, the feedback we're getting from our users is really good uh, because that's the first time we're offering something like that. And so far, so, so good. Did you involve real or prospective users in the API program? So any developer can um, basically go to live with uh, the hand-holding uh, by your documentation and your materials. So do you have feedback or... That has been the main challenge, right? Um, mm. First, you're trying to do your personas and you're trying really to define your onboarding process. But then usually what you realize is you don't cover all the different users. So actually the way you're thinking people who use the product is not the, the way they will do it. Yeah. So we started very early, Avaro can say more about that, but we started very early in the process by having an internal beta tester community helping us. So we even started mocking the poll, not even developing it. And starting testing already our mockings to see if it's what we're expecting users to do. So we had an internal beta tester based on Amadeus developers that were a bit biased, but still were able to provide some feedback. And very soon we built an external uh, beta tester community from different startups or partners we knew or people who were interested to onboard. And a lot of the way we built it or we improved or we decided the documentations we're building was really a user-centric or feedback uh, based of the users. Yeah, that's true. I think feedback it was key to to evolve the the products in terms of documentation, in terms of the way we're displaying information in the portal. Um, I don't know. There are many many examples or uh, how feedback helped to improve the the, the product. Um, for example, every time we go to a hackathon, beyond eating pizza and <laughs> having fun, so we do a lot of work within the, the event to really understand how people is using our APIs. If they are struggling to, uh, you know, to to move forward with something specifically, if they're Providing some kind of feedback, we we call it everything, and we bring that information back to the company, mm -hmm. and that is super super interesting and it's working really well. But not only with events like Hackathon, also in support channel, we receive people providing information or feedback, and that's super valuable for us as well. And the beta tested community, the internal beta tested that we started uh, at the beginning of the program, I think that was also very important. And I would say they help us to validate the way uh, of, um, for example, all the endpoints that we were uh, displaying, the, the way we were um, yeah, organizing the, the APIs that help us a lot to, to understand if that, that makes sense or not. Now, uh, hopefully, we will launch the, the system committee that Anthony was mentioned before. Um, yeah, so we have some cool stuff prepared, like mocking the, the server to prepare an isolated environment for our users, etc. So yeah, let's see. Looking forward to it. <laughs> and something you mentioned was super interesting is the hackathon. Hackathons for her uh, has been a very key part of building the, the product, building the APIs and the portal in very early phase. So we started with an internal hackathon uh, and then started launching quite a lot at the beginning external ones. And the first objective for us was really to collect feedback and to test the product. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, it's amazing. You'll literally have 50 or 100 people sitting there for one or two days that have never heard about you or very little. 
and they have to build something using the solutions. And you're there around really seeing where they struggle, what are the pain points they face, um, all the questions they have. And if you're able to extract this information, it's it's gold field bank. It really shows you from landing on your portal page until they have the solutions at the end to show you all the pages they face, what was the user flow, uh, the question they had. And it was really key for us to really uh, improve the documentation, improve the API designs, uh, and everything we're providing to our users. So it was really mm -hmm. key in our strategy. How do you capture that? The first one is human interactions. Uh, our team was heavily involved, uh, not only the relations, but the other people of the team being there at the events. Yeah, at the time, it was still physical events. Uh, being able to stand with the teams, to really sit with them, to help them on the design process, but as well on development. Uh, we had actually a survey at the end, a survey about the event itself, but as well a survey about what, they, what problem they have faced, what they have liked, what they are missing. Mm -hmm. And we did follow-ups as well with some of the teams to really go deeper into the process. And so far, we had very good feedback. They love to help to shape the product. They are not feeling that we're trying to extract information from them. They're like, no, we're actually super happy to help you. We say that and we think maybe that could be better. Hmm. So it was not that hard. If you're able to create this human trusted relationship with the people, you get, you get well with them and we are happy to share and to help. Yeah, actually, some of the APIs we already have in the catalog come from feedback provided by people from hackathons, for example. Hey, I'm missing this specific mm. data. Testing trend uh, points. Exactly. So mm. do you have an endpoint for providing X, Y, and Z? Uh, no, but OK, well, we took note. And <laughs> months ago, after the, the hackathon, we came up with the API. So that's super interesting as well. Thinking about the volume that you're dealing with, do you have like a statistical entry level number of Okay, this has been flagged before. So say having a thousand different support requests, but all of them are one off, that's hard to deal with. Or do you wait for the pattern to emerge? Yeah, we, we try to, to, we have a way, we try to put in place a way to extract the feedback and the recurrent feedback and to have a, a type of plus one when a similar feedback comes to prioritize then on our product team so they can prioritize what is the most important, what's the most important API, or what are the big changes to do. So most of our, actually, our roadmap is built on the number of feedback we receive from the customers, and then as well what makes sense for our vision. Uh, we have part which is automated with the with the support tool we use, and part that we actually, our product managers, are, are doing manually uh, on our side. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, but I think we're improving on that. So it's a mix of two, two different tools and a lot of <laughs> people work. <laughs> You are talking uh, about a lot of feedback, so I'm just wondering how do you cope with that many feedback? Because I already checked and uh, Amadeus uh, Developer Portal has quite exhaustive support page. Uh, you have different channels to support API users, for example, GitHub, Stack Overflow or, or direct contact. So how does it look from... The inside, how Amadeus handles feedback. Do you have a dedicated team? Because it's always uh, really great having feedback and real user feedback, but also has a dark side that it really needs some time to check and and elaborate. And it's a great question. Uh, we started with one person uh, taking care of the feedback. Sorry, the feedback support. Um, but of course, uh, the moment the, the, we started to have more and more people on board in the in the platform, uh, we decided to split the uh, support in three different channels. So whether you have a technical question, we redirect. We try to redirect people to Stack Overflow. So that that's good because we are using the Amadeus stack, so people can track uh, similar questions or even expect answer from another members of the community. But also we have GitHub in case you have a specific problem with an SDK or code sample or prototype. So the idea is um, allow people to open an issue on GitHub and then we can take care of it. But we have, of course, the typical support channel. No? And that is something that we changed recently and we are doing the, the roster. And we are rotating the, the support at duty. So we have the moment for people in charge of support. So mm -hmm. we spend like one week uh, fully working on support and then we keep going with our normal <laughs> stuff. And I think, I, I must say, it's... Um, 
It's very interesting. And this is one of the lessons learned from, from last year because um, you don't realize how people really use your product. And uh, even for ourselves, to educate ourselves with some specific corner case of the of the APIs, right? So sometimes we receive we receive questions from people that they're using the API in a way that we never thought about <laughs> before. Yeah, and that's the case with the internal testing team. So they have constraints because you are already biased. And exactly. You know the exactly. product, the API. Exactly. And, yeah. I agree with that. That has been, I think, a very good choice of the team for moving to have people, a few people fully dedicated to support and almost only doing that, to have this roster mindset in a team where every week you have a different person that is handling support. He did very well to our team in terms of uh, sharing the support work, which is not always seen as easy depending on the week. Uh, so allowing other people to work on other tasks. It helped a lot as well to bond the people in the team. So you always feel other people are here for you uh, uh, and so on. It has been incredible in learnings. Uh, I think this year the team has ramped up a lot. Uh, the support we do is technical, of course, uh, about our APIs. It's as well a lot about travel. And mm -hmm. in our team, uh, we had people who joined recently who are not part of the travel industry. And it's a lot to learn and to ramp up. And support, if you take it as a learning opportunity, it's really amazing. Because the questions pushes you to learn to be able to answer. And you have to write the answer. So you need to write an answer that explains. And to be able to explain something, you need to understand it very well. So the process of doing support as a learning channel has been great for our team. And as well, the mindset we have in a team where when you're on support, you don't feel you're alone there for one week and no one is there for you. It's all the team is here. Whatever question you have, you can ask and you will have someone helping you. We have functional, we have technical experts. So I, I really believe that way of having roster in a team and creating the support as a learning channel, but not as something that you're a punishment, it's really great. It's I mean, on our case, it, it works very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we receive question about one specific uh, data uh, from the API specification on one single endpoint that we we thought that we think like, oh my God, do we have that in our API? <laughs> so we need to go through the whole documentation to check that. Yes, okay. <laughs> So it's a, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to, to, to learn and to keep the, uh, you know, the, the product in shape. Do you have technical writers who call themselves technical writers? And where do they enter this? We have uh, our uh, colleague, uh, Christopher. Uh, hi, Christopher, if you are listening. <laughs> <laughs> He's our, uh, I would say, ten, I mean, literally we are all contributing with uh, mm -hmm. articles, tutorials, blog posts, etc. But yes, so this is something that we started to do at, from the very beginning. And uh, I mean, I mentioned Christopher because Chris is, uh, is pushing a lot to have more people uh, on board, not only from our team, but also from the company to write and to, to share knowledge. It's not something, we don't have the title, technical writer, yeah. uh, as mm -hmm. of today. We don't have it in our team. And actually, I'm not sure we have it in Amadeus as an, an official title. As I've already said, in our team, in DevRel team, uh, everybody is contributing. So we all write content. Uh, it can be more or less technical, depending on your profile, but everybody is writing. And Chris is our expert in making the article being clear, shining, and very clear for everybody. Mm -hmm. So we don't have official technical writers, but in several team, uh, we all contribute and we write mm -hmm. regularly uh, technical articles. Mm -hmm. I was sort of leading you with this question towards asking about API governance, because I, I find that fascinating. And we've been advocating uh, towards setting up a central editorial team once uh, you start creating a bigger storm inside the company. And you have been talking about that. I know that last year was a bit of a challenging year, but let me challenge you a little more. So that does not go down very easily when it comes to culture. So how did that work? The standardization and forcing everyone into the same process? Um, that's a good question because uh, I'm, I, I mean, internally in Amadeus, I, I think it's working, it's working great uh, because um, the governance is, uh, is not only that like, the control entity, as many people may think, but also it's like a community of API uh, designer experts, etc., that get together and share knowledge about the API. But of course, they also do the job of uh, 
taking care of the design of one single API coming from the company. Okay. I started to read uh, articles from the internet about people complaining about this kind of uh, governance, right? To avoid this uh, bottleneck in the companies. But in our case, I would say it's working fine. This is one of the feedback we are getting from our users that the, the way they are consuming APIs is the way they are expecting from us because all the APIs look the same. Even, I mean, we have, have at the moment three external APIs, what we call partner APIs which is basically APIs coming from external companies that they are exposing their API through our portal. So we did a lot of work with them to also standardize their endpoints before publishing them in our portal. That is thank you to the, to the governance. Uh, thanks to the governance, we have the, all the API consumers, they have the feeling that all APIs uh, belong to us, which is actually no, not fully true, no? Yeah, it's, um, it's working really, really great. I think it works as well very well. Um... We have the chance that the governance was in place even before we started. It was in place for previous APIs. Uh, but when we started Amadeus for developers and were able to bring really a lot of feedback to the API governance and to show that having consistent APIs, so your users, they learn to use one API and they know how to manage all the other APIs of the catalog, the pagination, the error handling, or everything is managed the same. So you learn once, you know how to use everything. And bringing all this feedback to the API governance help to strengthen the value. And I think that was the, the heart of it. It's trying to show the value it brings to the customers, but as well to the people in the company and not highlighting how uh, bottleneck it could be or how, uh, what's the constraint. And from directly user feedback, that I think is great. I, I took a bit of time learning the first API, but then I was able to standardize the usage of all the other ones and say, well, so what we do actually uh, is very useful. And you went that far that before the API governance was a recommendation uh, to be able to publish APIs, where now it's a mandatory step. So all the APIs we publish are actually going to the API governance. And it's not something we push for. We don't say, hey, if you want to publish into our catalog, you need, it's by the value people agree, okay, we should do that because it brings value. It helps to share the knowledge in the company because everybody is learning from the same guidelines. It helps to standardize the processes so we can create templates. We can standardize tooling because everybody is building the same way. And at the end, it brings value to our customers. The next step I'll say that I would love to achieve and it's very difficult is to bring that for internal APIs as well. And still in our process, we have a lot to improve, but uh, I think we're at least on the right vision, the right path, and we have the buy-in of the people, which is mm -hmm. what matters to me. If people start moving and trust in what they do, it takes time, but at the end, you're gonna achieve what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, and also, I think also beyond the typical standardization uh, duties, etc., I think the governance is doing a great job in uh, keeping the company up to date regarding new standards like uh, gRPC, async API, you know. So that brings a lot of value as uh, API designers and API company. So Amada will standardize or make uh, APIs consistent. So let's call it they are Amada will specific. But do you think there is something in Amadeus API documentation that is specific to your company? You also mentioned you have templates and tooling, but this is applicable for API documentation as well. Uh, actually, I don't believe we use anything really no. uh, specific for Amadeus. The tooling we use, we do stop light internally to design our APIs uh, and so on. So we work a lot with the company itself to provide feedback on the way we use it or or some very common kind of use cases because we have a lot of people using it. So we push the tool very far, but we use standard tools. Our internal guidelines are actually a mix of uh, JSON API, uh, .org guidelines and other guidelines uh, that by experimenting internally, we saw some cases that were not perfectly working for us. And our guidelines are evolving. We're actually, we would like one day to publish our guidelines publicly but that wouldn't be any surprise because we didn't reinvent the wheel. We literally no. learned from the good ones and tried mm. to make it work for us. So I don't think we have a lot of specificities. No, I think we're using quite um, standard tools, right? And um, so we follow us open, open API specification. Uh, we use the Swagger tooling for generating documentation. Um, I, I wouldn't say we are using something super, super specific. A uh, good point is we have complete freedom to, you know, to explore, adapt, uh, and play with new, uh, new tools regarding documentation. Uh, specification, et cetera.
you said that you can learn uh, basically from feedback and it's a great opportunity, but I wonder that what does uh, developer experience mean to Amadeus and how do you channel these great feedbacks back to your product or your documentation? Because learning is one thing, but uh, channeling and uh, transforming it to developer experience is a different level. So do you have a process for it or how do you handle it? It's a very good question. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's the question. <laughs> do you want to start or do you want me to uh, go, go, go ahead. Um, so you're right. Uh, learning is one thing, but then what do you do with the learnings and how do you, uh, and here we're talking about the learnings, but then how do you, the, the difficult feedback or the improvement you have to make. Uh, we have, first, we have the chance to have the product managers uh, of the API and the portal part of our team. So it means they are very close to us. And the other one, uh, driving the, the product backlog uh, of the portal in the API. So we use a lot actually the feedback to create our roadmap or our priorities. So based on the feedback, uh, if we see an API is missing or an API is not behaving the way we should or it's missing something, we're able directly from the feedback to transform that into a user story and to put that into the backlog of the different development teams. And that because the product manager is literally sitting with us makes it uh, much easier. So uh, that helps uh, a lot. Then on our side, the, the thing we try to do, we try to drive as well our content creation based as well on the support. So if we have very often the same similar question, it means something is not going well. So either the design of the API or the product is not great, or either the documentation is missing, then we analyze if it should be a tutorial, a guide, a blog article, and we create it. So a lot of the content creation we have is actually as well coming from the feedback or the support. So really we try to fill all that, we analyze it, it's, is it an improvement on product, go to the product manager, is it something we can tackle by uh, a guide, tutorials, uh, in the SDKs or code samples, it goes to our developer relations team and we build that content and it goes to the production. Mm -hmm. Now do we have a process, we have an internal process in the team, uh, we try this year to try different tools to as well automate as much as we can. I think that this is the part we can still improve and we're still learning from it. Uh, it works when you can manage the amount of feedback or the other requests you can manage on your side. Then for some of them are actually long. So they are part of the backlog. They go to the development team. It's going to take a couple of months to be developed. And then the new ones uh, get behind. But at the end, it's a matter of product management work, prioritization. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe. So we try to categorize the feedback by different areas like documentation, APIs, opportunities, things like that. And then we forward this information to the to the product managers. So yeah, that's something he was saying. It's not always easy. And the, the, the process we, we are following is uh, fully handmade. <laughs> we are not using something very fancy. And uh, yeah, if uh, one of the listeners or the, from the podcast has any experience using tools for categorizing and managing feedback, please let us know. <laughs> So first, if you want to name them, we, we are using Salesforce to manage our support requests. That helped, helped us a lot. Uh, I think this year we have been able to automate a lot of things, uh, KPIs, tracking, categorization of the questions. That helped us a lot. Uh, our product managers are using uh, um, the portal. I think they're the new tool that I'm not sure, but we're using Trello. We try GitHub. Mm -hmm. We tried another tool that I forgot the name. Uh, so far, Trello is actually doing the job. So we have a specific yeah. board when we're able to categorize, we're able to track who asked in what context, what was the exact feedback, how many times he came, uh, and so on. And then we're able to play with a basic yeah. Kanban board on different feedback. And then this is channeled into uh, internal Amadeus processes. And that because we work with many different teams, uh, depending on the team where you're going to use another tool. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that's the way we work. Still, we can improve, but um, so far it works. Thank you for all these insights. I have one very last question. Um, do you have a message you want to leave the listeners with? Mm. Oh, wow. I, I didn't prepare this one. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know. Anthony, do you have something in mind? In the meantime, I, I think uh, about my, my message. Yeah. Uh, the one is the one actually very linked to the presentation I did when we met in, in API the docs in Amsterdam is... Um, I think there are two things that are extremely important when you design an open product, whatever it is, API or not, and especially for developer audience, but I believe it could be applied somewhere else, is the notion of openness and transparency. At the end, on the way, we are all doing mistakes. We, we failed many times and we learned from it, but as long as you're doing it with being open, being uh, transparent and trying to do the right thing and being explain to the people what you do and why you did something wrong or why something is working, uh, that will work along the way uh, because building the trusted relationship is actually what matters uh, uh, on the way, at least in our job. 
uh, and the empathy is what makes the, the big difference. Put yourself into the shoes of the other person and that's how you're going to learn how, how they use your product and that's how you're going to be successful. If you're able to do that, being open, transparent and have empathy, I don't see why your product, or at least your developer relations team is not going to work. And my message is going to be short and, and <laughs> it's uh, please document your APIs. Don't assume that uh, <laughs> your API consumers uh, has previous, previous knowledge in your platform or even with uh, APIs, whatever the, the design or the architecture behind your APIs are. Please document and please don't assume things <laughs> because sometimes you would get sur surprises. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Thank you. I, I might just print and frame your takeaways both. <laughs> <laughs> we you. need to make a meme for the Alvaro's one. It's a very good one. I'm going to make a t-shirt with this one. <laughs> <laughs> Come in your APIs. <laughs> Come in your APIs. Right. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. It has been a pleasure. Um, hope to, Thanks uh, a lot. To be here again. <laughs> Likewise. Hope. Thank you. Hopefully very soon physically in another conference. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>